Good afternoon, everyone, especially to our professor, Dr. Rosita D. Bagsit. I will be your reporter and the philosopher, Jean Jacques Rousseau. Jean Jacques Rousseau was a French philosopher and writer of the Age of Enlightenment. His political philosophy, particularly his formulation of the social contract theory or the contractarianism, strongly influenced the French Revolution and the development of liberal, conservative, and socialist theory. A brilliant and disciplined and unconventional thinker throughout his colorful life, his views in the philosophy of education and on the religion were equally controversial but nevertheless influential. He is considered to have invented modern autobiography and his model Julie a la Nouvelle Halloy was one of the best selling fictional works of the 18th century and was important to the development of Romanticism. He also made important contributions to music, both as a theorist and as a composer. Rousseau was born on June 28, 1712 in Geneva, Switzerland. Although he spent most of his life in France, he always described himself as a citizen of Geneva. His mother, Suzanne Bernard, died just nine days after his birth from birth complications. His father, Isaac Rousseau, a failed watchmaker, abandoned him in 1722 when he was just 10 years old to avoid imprisonment, after which Rousseau was cared for by an uncle who sent him to study in the village of Busse. His only sibling, an older brother, ran away from home when Rousseau was still a child. His childhood education consisted solely of reading the Plutarch's lives and Calvinist sermons in a public garden. His youthful experiences of corporal punishment at the hands of the pastor's sister developed in later life into a predilection for masochism and exhibitionism. For several years as a youth, he was apprenticed to a notary and then to an engraver. In 1728, at the age of 16, Rousseau left Geneva for Annecy, in southeastern France, where he met Francois Louise de Warrens, a French Catholic baroness. She later became his lover. She also provided him with the education of a nobleman by sending him to a good Catholic school, where Rousseau became familiar with Latin and the dramatic arts in addition to studying Aristotle. During this time, he earned money through secretarial, teaching, and musical jobs. In 1742, he moved to Paris with the intention of becoming a musician and composer. He presented his new system of numbered musical notation to the Académie des Sciences, but although ingenious and compatible with typography, the system was rejected. He was secretary to the French ambassador in Venice for 11 months, from 1743 to 1744, although he was offered to flee to Paris to avoid persecution from the Venetian Senate. He often referred to the Republican government of Venice in his later political work. Back in Paris, he befriended and lived with Therese Lavachoul as semi literate seamstress who bore him five children, all of whom were left at the Paris orphanage soon after birth. Towards the end of 1740s, he became friends with the French philosopher Denis Diderot and contributed several articles for the latter's encyclopedia. However, their friendship soon became strained and Diderot later described Rousseau as being deceitful, vain as Satan ungrateful, cruel, hypocritical, and full of malice. His 1750 Discourse sur les sciences et les arts, or the Discourse on the Arts and Sciences, won him first prize in an essay competition on whether or not that the development of the arts and sciences had been morally beneficial, to which Rousseau had answered in negative, and gained him significant fame. He also continued his interest in music and his popular opera, Le Devin du Village, where the village soothsayer was performed for King Louis XV in 1752. 
He was outspoken in his defense of Italian music against the music of popular French composers such as Jean-Philippe Romeo, who lived between 1683 to 1764. In 1754, he returned to Geneva where he reconverted to Calvinism and regained his official Genevan citizenship. In 1755, Rousseau completed his second major work, the Discourse sur l'origine et les fondements de inégalité, or the Discourse on the Origin and Basis of Inequality Among Men, usually known as the Discourse of Inequality, which was widely read and further solidified Rousseau's place as a significant intellectual figure. However, it also caused him to gradually become estranged from his former friends, such as Diderot and the Baron von Grimm, and from benefactors such as Madame de Epinay, although he continued to enjoy the support and patronage of one of the wealthiest nobles in France. In 1762, he published two major books, The Social Contract, Principles of Political Rights in April, and Emily or on education in May. The books criticized religion and were banned in France and Geneva, and Rousseau was forced to flee. He made stops in Bern, Germany, and in Moutiers, Switzerland, where he enjoyed for a time the protection of Frederick the Great of Prussia and his local representative, Lord Keith. However, when his house in Moutiers was stoned in 1765, he took refuge in England with the, philosoph with the philosopher David Hume. Although he soon began to experience paranoid fantasies about plots against him involving Hume and others, he returned to the southeast of France incognito and under a false name in 1767. The following year, he went through a legally invalid marriage to his mistress Therese, and in 1770, he was finally allowed to return to Paris. One of the conditions of his return was that he was not allowed to publish any books, but after completing his confessions, Rousseau began private readings in 1771. He was ordered to stop by the police, and the confessions was only partially published in 1782, four years after his death. All his subsequent works were only to appear posthumously. Rousseau died on the 2nd of July, 1778, of a hemorrhage while taking a morning walk on the estate of the Marquis de Gerardin at Evernonville, near Paris. Sixteen years later, his remains were moved to the Pantheon in Paris, across from those of his contemporary. Now let us proceed to Rousseau's work. Rousseau saw a fundamental divide between society and human nature and believed that man was good when in the state of nature, the state of all other animals, and the condition humankind was in before the creation of civilization, but has been corrupted by the artificiality of society and the growth of social interdependence. This idea of the natural goodness of humanity has often led to the attribution of the idea of the noble savage to Rousseau. Although he never used the expression himself and it does not adequately render his idea. He did not, however, imply that humans in the state of nature necessarily acted morally. In fact, terms such as justice or wickedness are simply inapplicable to pre-political society as Rousseau understood it. For Rousseau, society's negative influence on men centers on its transformation of amour du soi, a positive self-love, which he saw as the instinctive human desire for self-preservation, combined with human power of reason into a more propre, a kind of artificial pride which forces man to compare himself to others, thus 
creating unwarranted fear and allowing men to take pleasure in the pain or wickedness of others. In his course on the arts and sciences in 1750, Rousseau argued that the arts and sciences had not been beneficial to humankind because they were not human needs, but rather a result of pride and vanity. Moreover, the opportunities they created for idleness and luxury contributed to the corruption of men, undermined the possibility of true friendship by replacing it with jealousy, fear, and suspicion, and made governments more powerful at the expense of individual liberty. His subsequent discourse on inequality in, 15, in 1755 expanded on this theme and tracked the progress and degeneration of mankind from a primitive state of nature to modern society in more detail, starting from the earliest human. Solitary beings differentiated from animals by their capacity for free will and their perfectibility and possess of the basic drive to care for themselves and the natural disposition to compassion or pity, forced to associate together more closely by the pressure of the population growth, a man underwent psychological transformation and came to value a good opinion of others as an essential component of their own well-being, which led to a golden age of human flourishing with the development of agriculture, metallurgy, private property, and the division of labor, but which also led to inequality. Rousseau concluded from his analysis of inequality that the first state was invented as a kind of social contract, but a flawed one made at the suggestion of the rich and powerful to trick the general population and institute inequality as a fundamental feature of human society. In the contract, in the social contract of, six, of 1762, his most important work and one of the most influential work of, philosoph of political philosophy in Western tradition, he offered his own alternative conception of the social contract, opening with the dramatic lines, Man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. One man thinks himself the master of others, but remains more of a slave than they. Rousseau claimed, contrary to his earlier work, that the state of nature was a primitive and brutish condition without law or morality, which humans deliberately left for the benefits and necessity of cooperation. He argued that by joining together into civil society, through a social contract and abandoning their claims of natural right, individuals can both preserve themselves and yet remain free because submission to the authority of the general will of the people as a whole guarantees individuals against being subordinated to the wills of others and also ensures that they themselves obey because they are collectively the authors of the law. It should be noted that Rousseau was bitterly opposed to the idea that the people should exercise sovereignty via representative assembly. Rather, he held that they should make the laws directly, which would effectively prevent the ideal state from becoming a large society such as France was at the time. To understand more the life, work, and philosophy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, I will bring you this short video clip about him. Modern life is deeply attracted to the idea of progress. In the 18th century, as European societies became ever richer and more technological, the conventional view 
was that mankind was firmly set on a positive trajectory from savagery and ignorance towards prosperity and civilization. But there was at least one 18th century philosopher who violently disagreed and who continues to have very provocative things to say to our own era. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was born to an educated watchmaker in Geneva in 1712. When he was 10, his father got into a legal dispute and the family was forced to flee Geneva. From that point on, Rousseau's life was marked by deep instability and isolation. As a young man, Rousseau went to Paris and there was exposed to the opulence and luxury that was the order of the day in Ancien Regime Paris. It was a far cry from his birthplace of Geneva, a city that was sober and deeply opposed to luxury goods. Then one day in 1749, he read a copy of a newspaper, the Mercure de France, that contained an advert for an essay on the subject of whether recent advances in the arts and sciences had contributed to what was called the purification of morals. In other words, was the world getting better? Rousseau experienced something of an epiphany. It struck him that civilization and progress had not, in fact, improved people. Instead, they had exacted a terrible, destructive influence on the morality of human beings who had once been good. Rousseau took this insight and turned it into the central thesis of what became his celebrated Discourse on the Arts and Sciences. His argument was simple. Individuals had once been good and happy, but as people had emerged from their pre-social state and joined society, they had become plagued by vice and sin. In this work, and in its twin, The Discourse on the Origins and Foundations of Inequality, Rousseau went on to sketch what it would have been like at the beginning of history, an idyllic period that he called the state of nature. A long time ago, when men and women lived in forests and had never entered a shop or read a newspaper, the philosopher pictured people more easily understanding their own minds and so being drawn towards essential features of a satisfied life, a love of family, a respect for nature, an awe at the beauty of the universe, a curiosity about others, and a taste for music and simple entertainments. The state of nature was moral and guided by spontaneous pity, empathy for others and their suffering. So what was it about civilization that Rousseau thought had corrupted people and led to moral degeneracy? Rousseau claimed that the march towards civilization had awakened in people an unhealthy form of self-love, amour propre, he called it, something that was artificial and centered around pride, jealousy and vanity. Rousseau argued that this destructive form of self-love had emerged as people had moved into cities and there had begun to compare themselves to others and created their identities solely by reference to their neighbours. Civilised people had stopped thinking about what they wanted and they felt and merely imitated other people, entering into ruinous competitions for status and money and losing sight of their own sensations. Rousseau is forever associated with the term noble savage because it was his work that described the innocence and morality of our ancestors and contrasted it with modern decadence. At the time Rousseau was writing, European society was fascinated by the plight of the native North American tribes. Reports of Indian society drawn up in the 16th century had once described the Indians as materially simple but psychologically very rich and interesting. Communities were small, close-knit, egalitarian, religious, playful and martial. However, within a few decades of the arrival of the Europeans, the status system of Indian society had been revolutionised through contact with the technology and luxury of European industry. Indians now longed for guns, alcohol, beads and mirrors. Rates of suicide and alcoholism had risen, communities were fracturing and factions were squabbling. The modern world had ruined the lives of people who had once lived happily in the state of nature. Rousseau's interest in natural goodness made him very interested in the idea, though not quite the reality, of children. In 1762, he wrote Emile, or On Education, perhaps the most successful book ever written about how to raise children. Rousseau suggested that children were born naturally good, and that the key to raising them was therefore always to prevent their corruption by society. This idea was widely influential. Parents who had before this time seen their children as wicked or at best as blank slates now viewed them as founts of wisdom and tried to give them a childhood full of play and visits to forests and lakes. Rousseau became the inventor of child-centred education. He was also a great proponent of breastfeeding, declaring, Let mothers deign to nurse their children and morals will reform themselves. Nature's sentiments will be awakened in every heart and the state will be repeopled. 
It was, he knew, a bit of a hyperbole, but it spurred a wave of breastfeeding even among the wealthy who'd long disdained the practice. Artists rushed to paint and honour the new vogue for breastfeeding. Because Rousseau so closely valued human beings in their original state, it followed that in the novels he wrote, Rousseau also constantly celebrated intense feelings rather than great deeds or social events. In his novel Julie, written in 1761, Rousseau depicted the excitement and anguish of an upper-class woman caught in a love triangle between her sensitive tutor and her boring but socially sanctioned aristocratic match. Rousseau's contemporaries might have seen Julie as unwise in her feelings as a passing fancy, but Rousseau painted her love in a higher light. He urged us to see its grandeur, depth and honour. In his writings about his own life, Rousseau was similarly romantic, or what one might unkindly call self-absorbed. In his famous Confessions, one of the first ever autobiographies, Rousseau spent pages exploring his inner life. How frustrating he found shopping, the surprising feeling of tenderness for his ex's new partner, or the joys of gardening. To him, these weren't trivial or self-absorbed topics. They were part of an important task, to show what living is like on the inside. I have conceived of a new genre of service to render to man, he boasted, to offer them the faithful image of one amongst them, in order for them to learn to know themselves. Rousseau died in 1778, aged 66. His reputation has continued to grow. He was, from beyond the grave, one of the heroes of the French Revolution, and he became an icon to a great many artists and writers of the 19th century. Rousseau can be considered as one of the founding figures of what we now know as the Romantic Movement, an ideology responsible for valuing the primitive over the civilised, the child over the adult, the passionate lover over the calmly loyal spouse. The modern world, despite its addiction to status, machinery and capitalist values, in many ways continues to be profoundly romantic in its heart. It's astonishing that so much of what we take to be common sense or just natural can directly be traced back to the work of one not always wise but always highly intriguing and provocative thinker. And that brings the end of my report. Before I will go, I will leave you these inspirational words from Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Everything we do not have at our birth and which we need when we are grown is given to us by education. With that, thank you very much and have a nice day.